Chapter 31 Blood and Life Leviticus 17, 1-16 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, and unto his sons, and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying, What man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox, or lamb, or goats in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, blood shall be imputed unto that man. He hath shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. To the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, and offer them for peace offerings unto the Lord. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and burn the fat for a sweet savour unto the Lord. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone a-whoring. This shall be a statute for ever unto them throughout their generations. And thou shalt say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers which sojourn among you, that offereth a burnt offering or sacrifice, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, ye shall even pour out the blood thereof, and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. And every soul that eateth that which died of itself, or that which was torn with beasts, whether it be one of your own country, or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even, then shall he be clean. But if he wash them not, nor bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. Leviticus 17, 1-16 Men in many an age have flattered themselves and believed that wisdom was born with them and that they represent the dawn of a higher consciousness. Job satirically answered Zophar's self-assured wisdom with words relevant for the Zophars of our time. No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. Job 12.2 The conceits of a self-assured wisdom lead to a remarkable blindness. This is certainly true where the laws of blood, as we find them in Leviticus 17, are concerned. Supposedly, these laws represent a primitive outlook which we have outgrown in our wisdom. But so-called primitive peoples were often more self-conscious and self-aware than modern scholars. Bloods meant life to them. Fraser, in writing on Incarnate Human Gods, reported, One of these modes of producing inspiration is by sucking the fresh blood of a sacrificial victim. In the temple of Apollo, a woman who had to observe a rule of chastity, tasted the blood of the lamb, and thus being inspired by the god, she prophesied or divined. At Aegira and Achaia, the priestess of earth drank the fresh blood of a bull before she descended into the cave to prophesy. Similarly, among the Kurovikarans, 
a class of bird catchers and beggars in southern India, the goddess Kali is believed to descend upon the priest and gives oracular replies after sucking the blood which streams from the cut throat of a goat. At the festival of the Alfurs in Minahasa, in northern Celebes, after a pig has been killed, the priest rushes furiously at it, thrusts his head into the carcass, and drinks of the blood. Then he is dragged away from it by force and sat in a chair, whereupon he begins to prophesy how the rice crop will turn out that year. A second time he runs at the carcass and drinks of the blood. A second time he is forced into the chair and continues his predictions. It is thought that there is a spirit in him which possesses the power of prophecy. The goal in such practices is that of Genesis 3.5, to be as God, to exercise divine power by consuming life. The power to kill has always been important to fallen man because it is the exercise of the control of life. What God reserves to himself, man claims. The first murder in history took place soon after the fall, Genesis 4.8. Lamech boasted of his power to kill, Genesis 4, 23 and 24. Murder is the exercise of ultimate power as fallen man sees it to take life. In some societies, those who exercised power had a restricted diet in order to heighten their powers. The Ganges or fetish priests of the Luanga coast are forbidden to eat or even see a variety of animals and fish in consequence of which their flesh diet is extremely limited, often they live only on herbs and roots, though they may drink fresh blood. American Indians carried on a quest for scalps as a means of manifesting their power and prowess. Some western gunmen knots their guns to boast of shed blood. The triumph manifested by many abortionist doctors in this tradition it is one of the ironies of the 20th century that men have most abhorred war and killing and have most commonly indulged in it. Obviously, their professions of peace have shallow roots. The Bible is neither respectful nor flattering where man is concerned. This makes its thrust seem ugly and primitive to the genteel humanists with their self-assured moral refinement and benevolence. Leviticus 17 regulates man's behaviour with respect to blood. First, sacrifices could only be made at the sanctuary in the wilderness and on entry into Canaan at designated places, Deuteronomy 12, 5 and 6, which included for a time Bethel and Shiloh. Failure to comply meant excommunication. Second, no sacrifice could be offered in the fields or at pagan altars, but only at God's appointed places. Leviticus 17, 7, Deuteronomy 12, 5 and 6, 11 to 14. Third, blood or life is God created and can only be taken in compliance with his law. Blood cannot be eaten without blood guiltiness. The penalty is cited as excommunication, but the sin is equated with manslaughter and murder. In verse 4 we see that failure to abide by this law is equated with shedding blood. When a man killed a game animal, the blood had to be drained and covered with dirt or dust. Verse 13 To respect blood means to respect God and his creation. Concern over blood has long been lacking in Christendom. The Jehovah's Witnesses, although given to many heresies, have been unique in their respect for biblical laws on blood and their opposition to blood transfusions. Their basis has been Leviticus 17, 14 and Acts 15, 28 and 29. Taking blood in any form has been wrong for them. The possibility of acquiring AIDS through transfusion as well as hepatitis B has begun to make an impression on others now. Henry B. Solomon, M.D., editor of the journal, Pathologist, has raised questions about the value of blood transfusions. Such transfusions have never been as safe or as necessary as routinely asserted. 
Dr. Solomon has written, There is a significant survival disadvantage when transfusions are given to patients undergoing surgery for cancer of the lung, breast and colon. Jehovah's Witnesses have insisted that transfusions are a bad idea. Perhaps one of these days they will be proved to be wrong. But in the meantime, there is considerable evidence to support their contention, despite protestations from blood bankers to the contrary. It is particularly noteworthy that these restrictions on the eating of blood, verses 10 to 16, are applied not only to believers, but to all within the land, including all aliens who were settled among them. It is a danger to all, both religiously and physically. There are five specific regulations in Leviticus 17. The first, verses 3 to 7, requires sacrifices to be made only where God's law so specifies. When separated from God's appointed place, demonic and alien practices intrude, as men practice, will worship and assert the sufficiency of their wisdom. Second, verses 8 and 9, these requirements apply to all, Israelites and foreigners alike. Third, verses 10 to 19, the eating of blood is forbidden to all, because all creatures and all life are God's property and creation. No man has any claim or jurisdiction over life apart from God's law. Blood is the life of every creature. Leviticus 19.26, Deuteronomy 12.23-25, Ezekiel 33.25, Zechariah 9.7. Obedience to God is a condition of a continuing possession of the land. Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Ye eat with the blood, and lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood, and shall ye possess the land? Ye stand upon your sword, ye work abomination, and ye defile every one his neighbour's wife, and shall ye possess the land? Ezekiel 33, 25 and 26. Fourth, verses 13 and 14. Animals unsuitable for sacrifice, that is, game animals, could not be treated callously. Their blood had to be drained and then covered. Fifth, verses 15 and 16. Clean animals which met their death other than by human hands are not to be eaten. A very practical consequence of these laws was to make the butchering and preparation of foods and meats in particular a matter of religious and hygienic concern. It is not surprising, therefore, that observance of these laws has led to better health even in recent history in Soviet Armenia, all farmers routinely went to a stone butchering block near the door of their church to kill the animal, shed the blood, and to leave the priest's portion as the law prescribes. Knight has called attention to an important aspect of these laws. Leviticus 17-26 to is commonly called the Holiness Code, although the whole book's concern is holiness. In paganism, the meaning of holiness is comparable to the Polynesian word taboo, meaning do not touch or you are in danger. It is also the Maori mana, an impersonal power. But God, who is called the Holy One of Israel, is the covenant God, whose law is grace, mercy and life to his people. So God's holiness was the power of his loving Righteous, saving presence in Israel's midst. The law is God's gracious gift. Israel was not a superior nation or people. Its advantage was the grace of God, and the law is an aspect of that grace. We are thus required to be holy and dedicated to God in all our lives and being, including our diet. Kellogg, title Leviticus 17. Holiness in eating and said in part. The moral and spiritual purpose of this law concerning the use of blood was apparently twofold. In the first place, it was intended to educate the people to a reverence for life and purify them from that tendency to bloodthirstiness which has so often distinguished heathen nations and especially those with whom Israel was to be brought in closest contact 
but secondly and chiefly it was intended, as in the former part of the chapter, everywhere and always to keep before the mind the sacredness of the blood as being the appointed means for the expiation of sin given by God upon the altar to make atonement for the soul of the sinner, by reason of the life or soul with which it stood in such immediate relation, not only were they therefore to abstain from the blood of such animals as could be offered on the altar, but even from that of those which could not be offered. Thus, the blood was to remind them every time they ate flesh of the very solemn truth that without shedding of blood there was no remission of sin. The Israelites must never forget this, even in the heat and excitement of the chase, he must pause and carefully drain the blood from the creature he has slain and reverently cover it with dust, a symbolic act which should ever put him in mind of the divine ordinance to the forgiveness of sin. Let us remember that this prohibition against eating or drinking blood was stressed by the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15.29. Given this fact, our Lord's words in John 6, 53-56 are all the more striking. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood's is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. It was more than a little offence these words carried to their hearers by New Testament times. The prohibition against blood was strictly observed. At the same time, nothing more clearly sets forth the meaning of these laws of Leviticus 17 than our Lord's words. The life is in the blood, and God is the author of all life. In idolatry, humanism, and the eating or drinking of blood, we see life below the level of life that God has ordained. Jesus Christ declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14.6 Man outside of Christ will look for life in evolutionary terms, backward in time and downward into the primeval chaos. In Cornelius van Til's words, he integrates himself downward into the void. Our Lord's reference to the elements in the sacrament of communion is an obvious one. To seek life by integration downwards is death. To seek life in blood rather than from the source of life, the triune God is evil and is death. To observe Leviticus 17 in its fullest sense means to live in Christ. To live in Christ means to reject the eating of blood and every quest for life outside of Christ. It means recognizing that only the blood of Christ can make atonement for sin. Otherwise, as our Lord says, ye have no life in you. John 6.53 In the bloody sacrifices, the blood was drained, that is, shed. It was then taken to the altar. Leviticus 17.11 is echoed in Hebrews 9.22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. This statement has reference to the law, to God's altar, and God's provision. The mere shedding of blood by man can affect no remission of sin, but rather aggravates it. When the blood is applied to the altar, the blood of the unblemished sacrifice, then there is remission of sin and the offering of one's life to God, who made and remade it. The word devils in verse 7, serim, means shaggy goats, goat-like deities or demons. Pan, Silenus, satyrs, fauns and like gods were worshipped in ancient Egypt, and thus were known to the Hebrews. The reference of early Christians to pagan deities as demons thus had Old Testament origin. These pagan goat deities were fertility cult gods. 
Just as drinking or eating blood was held to be the appropriation of life and divine powers, so too sexual perversions and ritual prostitution invoked the life force as a means of personal and social renewal. Of these devils referred to in verse 7, John Gill wrote, The word here used signifies goats, and these creatures were worshipped by the Egyptians, and so might be by the Israelites whilst among them. This is asserted by several writers. Diodorus Siculus says, They deified the goats as the Greeks did Priapus, and for the same reason, and that the pans and the satyrs were held in honour by men on the same account. And Herodotus observes that the Egyptians paint and engrave pan as the Greeks do, with the face and thighs of a goat, and therefore do not kill a goat, because the Mendesians regard pan among the gods, and of the Mendesians, he says, that they worship goats, and the he-goats rather than the she-goats, wherefore in the Egyptian language both pan and a goat are called mendes, and Strabo reports of mendes that there pan and the goats are worshipped. If these sort of creatures were worshipped by the Egyptians in the time of Moses, which is to be questioned, the Israelites might be supposed to have followed them in it. But if that be true, which Maimonides says of the Zabi, a set of idolaters among the Chaldeans, and other people whom they supposed to be in the form of goats, the Israelites might have given in to this form of idolatry from them. It should be remembered that the law associates bloody sacrifices with peace offerings. The goal is not death, but salvation, life, and peace.